Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Stan Goldenberg. I'm with the Hurricane Research Division of NOAA in Miami. And uh, I promise no hurricanes here or anywhere in the U.S. for at least a week. That's as far as I go. And by the way, you'll hear our forecast uh, for the 2010 season uh, announced in just uh, three days on Thursday. Not that it's worth anything. <laughs> I, I mean that quite seriously. One of the most inactive years recently was 1992. And those of us in Miami immediately know that was Hurricane Andrew with $25 billion in damage. So, uh, and by the way, nobody on our forecast team, just for interest, believes that the heightened activity we've seen since 1995 has been from uh, any type of global warming, man-made or otherwise. Anyway, let's get to our meeting here. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to do a quick uh, overview for those who weren't in my other session. How many here are career scientists? Can you please raise your hand? Okay, see there's far more scientists here than the speakers. And how many of you, we won't say career politicians, but let's just say current elected officials, or maybe even recent elected officials, please raise your hand. Okay, and how many of you are educators, meaning not at the college level, but educators, uh, secondary school educators? And, uh, and how many from the members of the media are present? Thank you. Okay, now for the legislator, special announcement, uh, you and your spouse or guest or anybody you can find from the street are invited to join <laughs> the uh, Heartland's government relations staff for dinner this evening. Compliments of the Heartland Institute, and many of the speakers will be there as well. That is gonna be in the Avenue Room on the fourth floor. And if you forget that information, you can come up and get a handout up here. Uh, but the Avenue Room on the fourth floor at 6.30 p.m. So that's for legislators and their guests. Uh, I'll tell you, reading the bios of some of our guests, I am and have not heard a few of these people. I am very interested in what we're going to hear today. Uh, we switched the order slightly. We're going to start off with uh, Joe DeLeo and then go to, uh, how do we say it, James Dillingpool. Dillingpool. Yeah, Dillingpool. Dillingpool, right, and uh, whatever accent uh, we do that with. And we've got a little of an international flavor here. Uh, uh, Joseph DeLeo is executive director of ICECAP, organization and website devoted to the climate change issue. He was a professor of meteorology for six years at Linden State College in Vermont. And from 81 to 88, he was the first director of meteorology at the Weather Channel. Uh, he was a weather producer for ABC's Good Morning America while planning the Weather Channel with John Coleman. Is John here this year? Or? Okay, this year. He's been a wonderful uh, speaker in the past. And he's a certified consultant meteorolo consulting meteorologist and a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and has served as chairman of the AMS Committee on Weather Anal Analysis and Forecasting and has chaired or co-chaired several national conferences, written a book, presented papers, on how research into ENSO and other atmospheric and oceanic phenomena and solar cycles have made skillful seasonal and even decadal forecasts possible. He's also written many articles and made numerous presentations on the roles cycles in the sun and oceans have played in climate change. Welcome our first speaker. I, I drew the short stick and that's how I got to go first. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, data issues brought about by ClimateGate. Um, of course, Hadley Center has been ground zero because of their role with the IPCC and uh, the source of the uh, emails. Uh, you most interesting email set, perhaps, belongs to uh, a program, programmer uh, called Harry, uh, who uh, stated that uh, their database was hopeless, no uniform data integrity, a catalog of issues to grow as they're found, hundreds if not thousands of pairs of dummy stations and duplicates, arg, there's truly no end in sight. This project is such a mess, no wonder I needed therapy. 
and I, I found very interesting on the CRU site, and his bio included data manipulation. <laughs> as a, as a. Phil Jones, the scientist at the center of the scandal at CRU, said to the BBC in a candid interview that his temperature data is in such disarray uh, it probably can't be verified or replicated. He said there was no statistically significant global warming for at least 15 years, and it's cooled at 1,200 degrees Celsius per decade from 2002 to 2009. And inter interestingly, he disavowed the science's settled slogan. Robert Boxer and Lisa Jackson, after the emails, distanced themselves from the EPA in the IPC report. Um, distanced the EPA from the IPCC report, Boxer said, in my opening statement, I didn't quote one international scientist or IPCC report. We're quoting the American scientific community here. God bless America. Of, of course, neither one would ever say that phrase, but uh, uh, CRU, let's compare CRU with NOAA and NASA. In uh, CRU's director, Phil Jones, acknowledged that uh, CRU mirrors the NOAA data. He says it's almost exactly the same as the GHCN. And NASA uses NOAA data both the, in the global uh, and uh, US data sets. We know that the three centers uh, in East Anglia, CRU, the NOAA set in, in Asheville, and NASA in New York City, and two microwave centers in uh, Huntsville, Roy Spencer and John Christie, and RSS in California. Now, the satellite and station data has been, uh, a discrepancy has been developing and increasing with time. Take, for example, June of last year when NOAA announced it was the second warmest June in 130 years. And in sharp contrast, uh, Huntsville said it was the 15th coldest and RSS the 14th coldest in 31 years. Now, you can't have both being uh, uh, the case, of course. This is a plot of the NOAA data and the uh, the satellite data, satellite in green and purple. And you'll notice it started out pretty close together. They've been diverging. They're now six tenths of a degree difference between them uh, with the uh, surface station data warmer. Now, greenhouse models predict that lower troposphere should warm more than the land. Uh, ben Santer at Lawrence Livermore says uh, 1.2 times as much. So the, the purple and the, and the green line should actually have risen above the blue line. The fact that it doesn't means one, either the climate gate, uh, the uh, greenhouse models and or uh, uh, greenhouse models are wrong, the greenhouse theory is wrong, or the, there is something wrong with the, with the data. And what could be wrong with the data? Well, there's a lot of issues. Uh, station dropout, 75% of the stations dropped out about 1990. The missing data increased tenfold after 1990. Urban adjustment is not used or totally inadequate, even though the population has quadrupled since 1900. Instruments have warm biases or are not designed for climate trend analysis, used for aviation, for example, with large error tolerances. We know about siting for mass majority of the stations that does not meet the government standards, resulting in significant warm biases. And major questions persist as to how much and when to adjust ocean temperatures for uh, changing measurement techniques. An opportunity for mischief exists there. Uh, adjustments are then made to the data, very often leading to a warming trend that doesn't exist in the raw data. And yet we pretend with all of these that we can detect trends to, with a precision of a tenth of a degree. To show the station dropout, there's this chart. The blue line shows the number of stations that peaked in the 60s and 70s at uh, around 6,000, dropped off to less than 2,000, 1,500. Uh, after 1990, and you'll notice the temperature shown in purple uh, shows a discontinuity uh, with that dropout. It warms as the, as the number of stations drop out. Now, they don't use average temperature of all the stations, they use anomalies, but this does show that the stations that remain have a warm, warmer bias than the original uh, data set in the, in the prime years in the 60s and 70s. This map shows the coverage of the data in 1978 when the station coverage was, was uh, uh, at its best. And you can see most of the land well covered. Look at the difference in 2008. What happened to Canada, Greenland, Brazil, Africa, the former Soviet Union? All those stations disappeared. The Moscow's Institute for Economic Analysis, and Ilya Aronoff is here, 
uh, and he's involved in that. He showed that the Hadley Center had used data from only 25% of the available stations, leaving 40% of the Russian territory uncovered, and that created 0.64 degrees Celsius greater warming than by using 100% of the raw data. And given that Russia represents 11.5% of global land, it is significant uh, in, 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 with respect to global temperatures. Uh, GHCN dropped by 50%. Here's Canada. The number of stations dropped from 600 to less than 50 after 1990. The percentage in lower elevations below 300 feet tripled, and those at higher elevations above 3,000 feet reduced in half. This was a map, thanks to uh, Verity Jones, uh, showing the Canadian stations in 1975. And the, the, the black diamonds are the ones that were used in the GHCN database. You see the strong coverage in the south, where there's a lot of, uh, most of the population is, but there is coverage well to the north, including the Arctic uh, uh, coast. Look what happens in 2009. These are the stations now used in the NOAA database. Mostly across the south, the only station in the north is Eureka, north of the Arctic Circle. Station, if you look in Wikipedia, that says it's the garden spot of the Arctic. Because although it's cold in, in winter, in summer, it's warmer than a lot of other places in the Arctic. Now, Ross and, and Pat Michaels showed the station dropout was very significant after uh, the, the, the uh, missing months in, in the remaining stations was very significant after the stations dropped out in 1990. This, this is the number of missing months in the data uh, for the former Soviet Union. Verity Jones has shown this is not just the former Soviet Union, but in all of the continents, there's been a lot of uh, missing months, an increase in missing months. In Africa and South America, you can see 90% of the stations have missing months now in the data. There's also the urban heat island effect, which we all recognize as being real. Uh, Brian Stone in 2009 in Georgia Tech is, is not a skeptic, but he found that approximately 50% of the warming that occurred since 1950 was due to land use changes. Uh, including urbanization, and he, he noted Atlanta warmed at twice the rate of the rest of the planet, and that's attributable to land use changes. Dr. Edward Long in an SBPI study uh, showed that urban areas uh, showed the hockey stick warming, but uh, the rural areas, and he looked at stations in every one of the 48 states, rural and urban, uh, showed a cyclical change, but uh, the temperatures at the end were no warmer than they were in the 1930s and 40s. And this is a typical rural station. We see the warming of the 30s and 40s, a cooling, and then a warming that falls short of the, the prior warm period. Now, there's been press releases from NOAA, from NCAR, from the IPCC about heat waves increasing at an alarming rate. This is the heat records for the U.S. states, uh, monthly heat records. There's 50 states, 12 months, 600 records here. And you see 1930s stands out. And recent decades have seen a decline, especially after the 1980s. And this decade has less heat records than any decade since the 1880s. You see a, an alarming increase in heat wave. This is the US data when uh, Tom Carl first developed it, uh, the US version in uh, 1990. And he used urban adjustment as one of the uh, factors. And you can see there was a cooling going on then the uh, 30s and 40s, uh, like a lot of the rural areas we looked at, were, were warmer than recent decades. Now, uh, at that time, James Hansen pu published it and actually said the U.S. has warmed during the past century, but the warming hardly exceeds year-to-year -year variability. Indeed, in the U.S., the warmest decade was 1930s, and the warmest year was 1934. He said that in 1999. That's an inconvenient fact, though. So what happens? They use PAL review to uh, find reasons to discount the UHI, and the UHI was removed from the U.S. data in version two of the U.S. data, and there's no urbanization, uh, urbanization adjustment in NOAA or CRU's global data based on flawed papers by Wang and Jones and Pedersen and Parker. The Jones and Wang paper in 1990 was shown by Keenan to be based on fabricated China data, and even Wigley agreed with that in one of the emails. And Jones himself found contamination by urbanization in China was one degree Celsius per century, but that didn't cause the data centers to begin adjusting for urbanization as that would have eliminated much of the global warming. This is the U.S. temperature uh, 
in 2008 after NOAA removed the adjustment. And here I'm toggling back and forth to version one to version two, and you can see the, the, the cooling of the earlier time period and the warming of the, the later time periods. In other words, hockey stick building. <laughs> this is the difference, version one to version two. Warming, recent years, cooling of the uh, prior warm period. Steve McIntyre uh, challenged Pedersen's statement in, in the paper in 2003, contrary to generally accepted wisdom, no statistically significant impact of urbanization could be found on the annual temperatures. Well, he showed the difference between urban and rural, in his, and Pedersen's own station set was seven-tenths of a degree Celsius, and in large cities, two degrees Celsius with the, the rural. And, and here's an example of one of the maps on his website, Climate Audit, showing the rural station in red, not much change in the uh, major cities showing a significant warming, the difference of the two, about two degrees Celsius. We know about major station siting issues, thanks to Anthony Watts, who's speaking next door, uh, or down this, this way. 90% <laughs> of the 1,067 stations that he surveyed out, in, out of the network as of October did not meet government standards. We have the now familiar uh, station on the, did everything wrong on a, on, a, on a driveway next to a building, next to a bush, over a Weber grill on the left, the station on the right, next to the building, next to an air conditioner exhaust, uh, Tucson, Arizona in the parking lot, uh, many at waste treatment plants, uh, this, many at airports, this one in Rome, Italy, to show you it's an international problem, is uh, right downstream from the jet exhaust, <laughs> Stevenson Shelter. There's a lot of peer review that show that 30 to 50 percent or more of the warming since 1980, 1880 has uh, due to this uh, contamination of the data by urbanization, uh, bad siting, et cetera. But the, um, they don't stop there. They apply an addi additional adjustment at the end to the, to the data once gathered, homogenization and other adjustments that accentuate the warming here is Davis, California, the university, the ag uh, farm, and blue was the original raw data. After they adjusted, we have the red. So, so you have a cooling trend that becomes a warming trend. They don't touch the recent data, because you might notice that, but the old data gets cooled off. Is it a, we could find, I could show you many, many, many examples of that. Here's one from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, where there's an investigation going on of NEWA, by the way, by the Australian government. Um, and you can see the uh, unadjusted data flat, but the adjusted data showing it distinct warming. In Darwin, uh, Air Australia, uh, Willis Eisenbach on what's up with that posted this, showing a cooling trend of 0.7 after the adjustment was turned into a warming trend of 1.2 degrees Celsius per century. Is NASA any better? Well, the emails uh, that uh, CEI obtained say no. Even Rito Rudy from, uh, from uh, NASA says, my recommendations to a reporter is that you continue using NCDC for the US and, and East Anglia data for the global. CC, GIS uh, temperatures change regularly. In fact, John Goetz in Climate Audit uh, found that 20% of the data changed 16 times in two and a half years ending in 2007. Okay. Uh, and you'll notice in 2007, there's a cooling there. That was Steve McIntyre's millennium bug. They fixed that. They kept it the same for uh, a, uh, another year, because people were probably watching. But look what happened in 2009 with the panic of the, of the cooling. They found all that warming again, and then some. Every, every year was warm. They build a hockey stick. Uh, this is a NASA chart on the left showing that the 1960s and, and, and blue were by a three tenths of a degree colder than the 1950s in the 1980 plot. In 1987, it was only 0 0.05 degrees cooler. And by 2007, it was 0.5 degrees warmer in the 60s and the 50s. Finally, the ocean temperatures. Uh, we transitioned from surface layer buckets to deeper ship intake to more than drifting buoys. Satellite IR skin temperatures were used until July 2009 when it was dropped because of a coal bias 
the dropping of the satellite data added immediately 0.24 C to the global ocean temperatures and 0.15 to the land since, since the land, oceans are 71 percent of the earth. Now, that, they announced in July in a press release, the oceans are now the warmest they've ever been. Uh, and every month since then, they've had a similar press release. Argo diving buoys were deployed in 2003, worldwide coverage, but not used operationally. Uh, talked about a area for uh, mischief. Tom Wigley in an email said, that warm blip in the 1940s, we can do something about it by cooling off the oceans by 15 hundredths of a degree. This would significantly affect the global mean, but it would still be plausible. He also worried that the oceans um, were warming less than the land, uh, half as much, and this might prompt skeptics to say urban warming was real and important. So what does NOAA do? They keep finding more warmth. This is not the trend in ocean temperatures. This is the difference between NOAA and NASA. So NOAA keeps finding more warmth in their ocean temperature than NASA does. Uh, and this was before the adjustment 0.24 upwards. This is Tisdale in 2009. There's your Argo buoys. Uh, you see the good coverage. You'd think that you'd be able to use that. Here's uh, Craig Lowell showing that the temperatures are uh, decreasing, which is the reason why they're not using uh, the, the temperatures. What are the chances of all these happening and, and flipping a coin eight times, getting heads eight times? All of these things produce a warming. The chance, it's not impossible. One in 256 two, percent chance uh, that you could get warming accidentally uh, by, uh, with, uh, with these changes. Now, man-made warming is real, but the men are in East Anglia, Asheville, and New York City. And the statement was made, if we torture the data long enough, it will confess. And it's starting to confess. The bottom line, these factors all lead to significant uncertainty and a tendency for overestimation of century-scale temperature trends. An obvious conclusion from all the findings in our updated paper is that global data bases are seriously flawed and can no longer be trusted to assess climate trends and initialize, calibrate, or validate climate models. And consequently, the surface data and models should not have been used for decision-making by the EPA or Congress. And even Judith Curry of Georgia Tech said there's a need for a new independent effort to produce a global historical surface data set. The public has lost confidence in the data sets, even the GHCN. And no replication uh, can, is, is, is occurring, and replication is required by the Data Quality Act. How did we get here finally? It didn't start with her, but Noah's Jane Lubchenco said when she was president of AAAS in 1999, urgent and unprecedented environmental and social changes challenged scientists to define a new social contract in exchange for public funding. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower in 1961, last slide, in his, in his farewell address to the nation, remembered most for his military industrial complex comments, also warned public policy could become captive of a scientific technological elite. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocation, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yeah.